is in adoration and wonder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Father God, just pray for Stuart now. Mm-hmm. Even though his body's weak, his spirit is strong. Mm-hmm. I pray for him that you would just give him physical strength this morning to be able to get through this sermon, but preach a word that is powerful and life-changing. Amen. 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 It's great to be here this morning. Um, If you see me dart out the door, it's because my tummy's been playing funny on me. And uh, yeah, I just don't want to bless you in other ways that you don't want to receive. Um, But yeah, we'll be good. Uh, Show of hands, who here loves carols? Who loves a good Christmas carol? So we had a bit of a debate on the WhatsApp group for the worship team about how many carols should be sung this Sunday. And there was kind of people, some people voted, I I voted, the more the merrier. I'm I'm a big carol fan. Um, Some people voted, some of us who are maybe a bit more on the Scrooge side, voted that we should only, like, we're just, yeah, Christmas is Christmas. Why should we have carols? But carols is very much a part of this season, isn't it? And so I wanted to test your carol knowledge a little bit, okay? So I'm going to sing a couple of lines (coughs) without vomiting, and you're going to try and sing the rest of it, okay? So, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Right, great. Okay, that was an easy one. I started you off easy. Hey? <coughs> joy, joy, joy. Uh, all right, I didn't even know this key, but that's fine. The first Noel. Very good. This one's a favorite for any nativity. Away in a manger. Yeah, you know it. What about this one? Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> we want to wish you a Merry Christmas. It's one of those ones we all sing, but we don't really know what we're saying, isn't it? Let's be honest. But one of my personal favorite Christmas carols actually has come, and that's where the writer of this song uh, has kind of stole the whole part of it. But it's, Oh, come, all ye faithful. Joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, O come, let us adore. That's my sermon done, guys, so I'm good. But this is one of my most favorite carols. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. I don't know about you, but what comes to mind when you think of the word adore? You know, if you put adore into Google, not much comes up in a manly term. You get the female perfume, j'adore, what is it, Dior, j'adore, perfume. I don't even know how to say it. Uh, you can, maybe you think of chocolates. Maybe you adore chocolates. Maybe it's a, when you see that squishy baby that's all gooey and nice. Maybe you want to adore that baby. But I wonder if the word adore instantly makes you think of Jesus. Whether you instantly think of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, I was at a Graham Kendrick event and that song was played. And the lyrics say, come let us adore him, oh come let us adore him, the Lord, worship Christ the Lord, let all that is within us adore. What is it today that we adore? What is it today that we find ourselves adoring in our everyday lives? Many of us would love to say, oh, in this morning, oh, it's definitely Jesus, it's always Jesus. But as the word says, they will know you by your fruit. And so I wonder, what does your fruit say of you and me? What do we adore on a daily basis? And so I was thinking about adore, and I was trying to look through the Bible to see the word adore. And as I was looking, I was like, surely there's 
the word of the door has to be in the New Testament. No, no, no. So I went, okay, New Testament fails me. I'll go to Old Testament. I went to Old Testament. Could I find the word of door? Only in one place. And that is Song of Solomon. And trust me, I'm not preaching from Song of Solomon. Don't worry. <laughs> but the, the word of door actually doesn't feature very often in the Bible. It's not a, a word that actually we find very commonly in the word of God. Is the screen dead? Fabulous, great time. Um, so, uh, the word adore, um, the dictionary definition um, does say that the word adore, uh, it talks about a regard with the utmost esteem, love, and respect, and honor. It says to pay divine honor, to worship, and to adore God. And I love this one. To love the, with, in the highest degree. To love in the highest degree. To regard with the utmost esteem and affection. And to idolize. Whoa. We don't like to think of God and idolizing. But actually we adore him. And we hold him in the highest esteem. You know in the Jewish uh, background we understand that adore and worship were very much the same thing. And we, if we go through the Bible a little bit, we can start to understand what that concept of adoration was according to the Jewish background and to the Israelites. And so if we go all the way back to Exodus 3, we see that it, the, it began there with Exodus 3 verse 5 when, when it says here, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. As an act of adoration, in an act of esteem and respect for the Lord God Almighty, Moses was told to take off his hands and we uh, his hands, take off his shoes. And we see that again in Joshua, where he is told, "Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground." We also understand from Genesis 17, verse three, when Abraham fell face down to the ground, he was showing a form of adoration and worship. Just as Psalm 95 verse 6 says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let us come and bow down. The Latin word says, adortio, however you pronounce it. It says it's a designated act of worship due to God alone. I wonder how much of our lives we focus on God alone. How much of our lives do we dedicate to him on a daily basis? How much do we adore Christ in this season? How much do we adore Christ in every season, in every high and in every low? And so I was thinking about this and I was thinking about three, three kind of responses and three kind of parts of the journey of adoration and responses to, our, to the way in which we adore Christ. That's not going to be resurrected at any point, is it? We should probably just lay hands on that projector and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Um, but So the first one, the first point I had was, come let us ignore him. And you're like, whoa. But if we look at the Bible passage, we see that Jesus was ignored from the very beginning of his life. In, uh, in uh, the passage in Luke 2, verses 1 to 7, we have the story of, of Mary and Joseph being, had been called to, to, uh, to go to Bethlehem according to the census. And as they arrived, um, they arrived, and it says here, uh, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And as she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The very beginning of Jesus' life was a sense of ignoring him. There was no room for Jesus in Bethlehem. The promised Messiah who was fulfilling the prophets of old, which said, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me. One who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. They had a prophetic word that actually out of Bethlehem would come the risen Lord Jesus, the one who would, who would be the savior of Israel. But there was no room for him. Oh, come let us 
ignore him. They ignored him. There was no welcome. There was no celebrations. There was nothing. There was no room for the king of kings. And I wonder if you can imagine right now with the hustle and bustle of Bethlehem. Everyone was trying to go about their day. Everyone was trying to, to make money, was trying to make sure that they were conquering life. Was Maybe children were playing. The, the ladies were chatting in the, in the marketplace, whatever was happening. It was a busy place. And I love this quote by uh, Max Accardo. And yeah, we'll, I'll read it. It says, They were too busy. The day, uh, the day was upon them. The day's bread had to be made. The morning's chores had to be done. There was too much to do to imagine that the impossible had occurred. God had entered the world as a baby. Yet were someone, were someone to chance upon the sheep stable on the outskirts of Bethlehem that morning, what a peculiar scene they would behold. The stable stinks like all stables do. The stench of urine, dung, and sheep reeks pungently in the air. The ground is hard and the hay is scarce. Cobwebs cling to the ceiling and the mouse scurries across the floor. A more lowly place of birth could not exist. Meanwhile, the city hums. The merchants are unaware that God has visited their planet. The innkeeper would never believe that he had just sent God into the cold and the people would scoff at anyone who told them that the Messiah lay in the arms of a teenager on the outskirts of their village. They were all too busy to consider the possibility. Those who missed his, majesty, uh, his majesty's arrival that night missed it not because of evil acts or malice. No, they missed it because they weren't looking. And little has changed in the last 2,000 years. They missed it because they simply weren't looking. I wonder this morning whether we are looking for Christ in this season. Whether we are expectant to adore him with all that we have. Sometimes we don't always get our priorities right. And I would have shown you a very funny video, but unfortunately our technology fails us. But it's a video about a, a couple that break down on, on a pair of uh, train tracks. And you can hear the ding, 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 ding. The train is coming and they've broken down and he's trying to start the car. And nothing's going. It's like, oh, oh, oh. So they just give up because they could hear that the train is coming closer and closer. So they decide to, 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 to go and, and get out of the, the car. And as they hear... The... Okay, yeah, it's fine. No one, we're not... Don't worry about it. Um... And uh, yeah, as, as they were kind of thinking, they realized, oh, I've forgotten something. So the wife rushes to the car and she picks up the, her, her shopping. Is it coming back? Okay. Okay, then. Let's try it then. As I watch this this week, I thought, how real is that, though, in many ways? We can get so busy in this season of the shopping and of our things and of the things that we need to do, our checklists, that we often leave the baby or we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Isn't that the phrase? And so often we actually realize, we might not realize it, but 
we begin to ignore him. And I had, we had an interesting discussion with Matthew just before the service. Well, we don't pay as much attention on Easter. And I said to him, well, Easter wouldn't have happened if Christmas didn't happen. And he said, well, you wouldn't, get, you wouldn't be saved if it, if it wasn't for Easter. Well, you wouldn't be saved if it wasn't for Christmas. Because Easter would never have happened. The miracle of Christmas should bring us to our knees. We shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't get too familiar with it because it's powerful. John 1 says, He was in the world, and though the world was not through him, uh, was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born into the into of, uh, born of nat- nature, uh, sorry, children born of a natural nat- uh, descent, nor of human decision or a, hu- a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh, and we know this, and made its dwelling amongst us. We have seen His glory and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I wonder this morning, do we ignore him or do we acknowledge him? And I come to my next point, do we explore him? Oh, come, let us ignore him. Oh, come, let us explore him. The Christmas story is full of uh, different characters, isn't it? We've got the shepherds that, that uh, hear the good news of the angels, and I'm not going to read the passage um, because, yeah, it should be on the screen. Oh, there you go. It's on the screen. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. So, yeah, the, the, we hear of the, the, the shepherds hearing the news of the newborn king. And we understand that their, their response is one of, of actually, I think, of great uh, admiration. I, I, I admire the shepherds who, who were probably the lowest of the low in society's realms. But their, their, their attitude even though they must have been massively overwhelmed by this great multitude of angels. I mean, to be honest, I think I would have run the opposite direction. Actually, their response was, no, let us explore this king. Let us explore what is being said to us. They say, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has been made known to us. Let us go over to Bethlehem and see what has happened. I wonder if that is our expectancy in this season of Christmas. Do we have an expectancy to see what is going to happen in this season? Do we have an expectancy to to see Jesus, the, the, the Savior of the world, come to be born as a little baby boy? To see what he can do this Christmas through tonight's carol service, through next week's nativity service. Do we have an expectancy and a faith like that of the shepherds to say, I want to explore and know more of this King of Kings. I want to explore and know more of the majesty, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the heavens, the earth and the stars. Do we have an expectancy and a hunger to explore more this season? They didn't waste time. They didn't stop and question. They didn't decide to like, let's have a little meeting about this. No, they decided to go. And we see it in the life of the, 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 the wise men as well, or the, uh, the magi, whatever you want to call them. It says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we, for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. They decided to explore and find this promise, this amazing thing that was potentially going to change history for the rest of their lives, for the rest of the world. They were astrologers who traveled, who constantly studied the stars, but they traveled so far in order to explore and find out just a little bit more. I wonder if we have that same passion to explore Jesus this season. As I was thinking about how much I explore Jesus, I was thinking about his supremacy as a baby. So often at Christmas, we talk about the lovely, cuddly Jesus. But did you know that in Colossians 1 it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He exists before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything. 
in the heavenly realms and on the earth, he made the things we cannot see and the things we, sorry, he made the things we can see and the things we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He exists before anything else, and he holds all creation together. This baby, Lord Jesus, Christ, is also the head of his church, this church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. And he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And get this. This includes you, you who were once far from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Jesus in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. I don't know about you, but that just blows my mind that all of that was in Jesus as a baby boy. And I wonder this season, are we exploring that reality? Are we exploring more of who he is? Because Napoleon, the great, the great French leader, said this, Everything in Christ astonishes me. The nearer I approach him, the more carefully I examine. I search in vain in history to find one similar to Jesus Christ or anything which can approach the gospel. Neither history nor humanity, nor the, angels, nor the ages nor nature, offer me anything with which I am able to compare it to or explain it. Here, everything is extraordinary. Amen. Hallelujah. That a man who didn't proclaim himself as a Christian understood that there was nothing on this earth as magical and as wonderful and as powerful as the Lord Jesus Christ, who came as a baby boy. You know, I was at, this week we had our first live nativity for, no, not live nativity, nativity for Olivia. It was her first nativity at school. And, you know, as you expect, kids and nativities are just great fun. There's lots of chaos. Kids are kind of doing, picking their nose, doing all sorts of random stuff. And it's, but it, there, was so, there was such a special moment. As Olivia delivered her lines and she kind of took on her role as an angel. And they sang a song which was really quite interesting. And it sang, they sang this. A king is born, a baby's born today, a baby's born for everyone. A baby's born today, a baby's born to save us all. Sing praise and worship him, for he is Christ the Savior. And call him wonderful. For he is son of God. These little kids at the age of four and five years old were singing some of the most powerful words that I've ever heard. They were exploring the king of kings. Why? Because he was born for you and he was born for me. He was born for each and every one of us. So we may, we may first... Ignore him. And actually, we realize, actually, no, we need to begin to explore him. And hopefully, lastly, and most importantly, we will come, let us adore him. We ignore him. We explore him. But hopefully, this season, we'll do a lot more of adoring him. We see the Magi, as they approached it, that says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great Joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. I wonder if our response to Jesus is to fall down and worship him. You know, often at Christians, we have the right words at Christmas. We have the right songs to sing and we, we do the right things. We go to the right services. We, we pray the right prayers 
But sometimes it can be lip service, not always a, an action of the heart. Jesus said himself, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And I wonder this morning how our heart is, is in before the Lord God Almighty. You know, I was thinking about this idea of love and adore. And I was thinking about the peace and how much I love and adore her. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, okay, you know, love, I think everyone can love someone, but I think it takes so much more to adore them. You can love someone without adoring them, but you can't adore someone without loving them. And as I was thinking about this, you know, Lapeace always has this, this like sixth sense, this Jedi Knight style kind of thing. Like she knows when I'm maybe not, uh, not right or I'm maybe not loving her the way I should. And I don't know how women do it. They just know. Like they know that we're not on the same wavelength, don't they? They just have this kind of vibe. But as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, I can say the right things to her, but Lapeace can see right through it. That she can see right through when I'm saying things, but I don't really mean them. And I wonder how often that is for us with God. How often do we say things, but actually we don't always mean them. As the worship team come up, I want us to think about that idea that they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I love that Matthew talks about rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Our adoration of the Lord God Almighty should be that which is so full of joy that as people, as we encounter people, we cannot help but tell them of the good news that we've heard. We can be so overwhelmed with joy that we, are, we fall on our knees and we worship him. Just as the, the Greek word worship means to fall prostrate before him, to kiss the ground in reverence and in awe of the Lord God Almighty. God is a jealous God. And he longs for our affection. He longs for our adoration. And this Christmas, in the busyness of it all, in all that can happen with everything, and it's not bad, it's all good. Christmas jumpers are great. The turkey is great if you're a turkey lover. Some of you don't like turkey, I know. But is that our priority? Or is our priority every, each and every day to be like the wise men? To come before them, to come before Jesus, to kneel down before our maker and to offer him all that we have. Spurgeon said, those who look for Jesus will see him. Those who truly see him will worship him. And those who worship him will consecrate their substance to him. I wonder this morning, are we consecrated before God? Are we offering ourselves in adoration for the King of Kings? O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. The Lord, worship Christ the Lord. Let all that is within us adore. My prayer, and I hope your prayer, is that it says, like like, like that song says, the very last line says, I will bring my life, my love, my all. If Jesus was before us now, how would we adore him? Would we take off our shoes? Would we bow before him? Would we kiss his feet? I wonder this morning, what is your response? Maybe you've begun to ignore him. Maybe you are exploring him. But my prayer and our prayer is that we will each adore him. For he is Christ the Lord. Let's stand up and worship him now.